butterfly glyph is exactly like that, except that the sphere opens, so it's like antennae. So it should come as no surprise that the Ankh is nothing more than a slight variation of the butterfly glyph, or that the children who perished in the Nazi death camps chalked the walls with butterflies, or that the face of the pharaoh on the sarcophagus rises from the chrysalis beard like a sun, the sun which in the Book of the Dead is called both eternal and incomprehensible and also joyous. Creator of eternity, the sun is born of water. A pharaoh's tomb is a symbol of the word. Perhaps it was a vowel. In the sacred text of Islam, it is said to be a small sequence of vowels that set the world of things in motion. Steeped in gum, surrounded by jars of tripes and wine, the pharaoh is poised at the world's edge, waiting in expectation of dissolution and the acquisition of a new orientation and identity. In other words, the tomb is an ever-evolving text, a form of dynamic earth and sky writing, an act of magic and a place of knowledge. Everything within it conspires to unbind the spirit from its husk and assure its release. In Arabic, the verb to release is synonymous with the verb to write. A final reading. The fruit of the calotrope, the toxic bearing plant of the monarch's caterpillar, the monarch's caterpillar pillar feeds upon is doubled. It looks like a pair of testicles. When the poet says to his lover, your balls are like the fruit of the calotrope, he speaks to his desire, to the lover's life force, he speaks to death, the risks of love's death, the death of life, but also he evokes regeneration. All these are among the mutable forms Eros takes and the lover embodies Eros. Like the gods, he possesses the fluid of life. Imagine with me, if you will, a book that, like the heartbeat of a lover, pulses to the rhythm of the reader's heart. The heart that for the Egyptians was the place where memory was safely kept, memory and the imagination. Part four, Adam Enkidu. Quote, he saw the lions round him, glorying in life. Then he took his axe in his hand, he drew his sword from his belt, and he fell upon them like an arrow from the string, and struck and struck and destroyed and scattered them. In the distant past, there was the idea that all things gave and received energy. This exchange was vital and it was essential. It was thought that a very real correspondence existed between all creatures and things, minerals, the living soil, the living waters, plants. Much as a letter is sent and awaits an answer, these gave and received from one another. And there was the magical idea that the structure of a thing was connected with its name, that to change the name was to change its inherent qualities, such as Adam, who is formed of clay, Adama, Adama is an active principle that refers to the tilled soil and the earth with which one builds an altar. Its color is red. Dam is a word for blood. Adam's nature is also volcanic. He is made in darkness and secret deep within the earth, and he is red with fire. The early stage of his creation is called the glowing. There is an ancient book written in Syriac in which Adam's face is described as beautiful as the sun. His body, his face, his eyes all glow mightily like the sun. So you see, Adam cannot be disassociated from his name. He is red hot, volcanic, earthly, magnetic. Plato tells us that every living thing is hot and has a flame residing within it. When in the darkness the god breathes into Adam's nostril and brings him to life, this breath is called nafah, the breath that kindles fire. Once a person had two names, a secret name that assured his safety and potency and a serviceable everyday name. Creatures, plants like the owls and lotus blossoms and willow trees of Egypt had names whose very sounds were the instruments of spiritual energy. But when Adam gives names to things of fire and breath, his singular power, his privilege, and his alienation are openly declared, and Eden's capacity to inspire and regenerate is compromised. Moral complexity is not Adam's forte, nor is clairvoyance. 
He is the son of Yahweh, after all, and domination is to his taste. Like a grocer, he parcels out the animals, those that creep upon their bellies and thrive in confusion, the venomous scorpion, the snake, those he despises. The docile cattle he enthralls, and in envy, fear, and ignorance demonizes the wild beast. The intuition that all forms surge from the same flame, the same breath, and that all living things are siblings, Adam obscures. Which brings us to another seminal myth that persists not only because of its tragic beauty, but its psychological acuity. The story of Enkidu, that other man as he was in the beginning, and Gilgamesh, his king. The story of Enkidu and Gilgamesh is above all one of alienation and guilt, of notoriety confused with and exchanged for eschatological salvation, and an ecstatic journey devolving into a progression of violent and self-defeating acts that lead to an apocalypse, the very apocalypse we face, the obscurification of nature. In this way, it can be read as a parable for our own age in crisis. Gilgamesh the king is above all a builder of cities, and the story opens with a walk through Uruk, a great city masterfully built of oven-fired brick. One third of Uruk is given over to quarries of clay, and close at hand the forests provide fuel for the kilns. This is how Gilgamesh makes his mark upon the world in brick. And he is like a brick wall, a tyrant and a rapist, he is unyielding and incontrainable. So abusive has he become, the gods are called upon to intervene, and so in silence, the goddess, quote, conceives an image in her mind. She dips her hands in water and pinches off clay, which she lets fall in the wilderness, a falling star, Enkidu blazes to earth. Like Adam, Enkidu is made of clay. Like Adam, he glows. Born of fire and breath, I think he is like the sacred vowels of the Arabs that open the door to sublime understanding. Vowels like the mim, the wa, and the nun that Ibn Arabi describes so passionately that have no beginning and no end and contain the infinite possibility, possibilities of the created, the imagined world. Such is Enkidu's promise, a lucent world of infinite possibility. A savage man, he lives in perfect understanding among the creatures of the forest. It is significant that before he is made, he is dreamed. Above all, the epic of Gilgamesh is a revelation of the profound significance of dreaming. Word of Enkidu's strength and beauty reaches the king. But before they meet, Enkidu blazes into Gilgamesh's dreams, first as a meteor too heavy to be lifted, and then as a gleaming axe fallen to the street. When he asks his mother the meaning of his dreams, she tells him Enkidu is the brave companion who rescues his friend in necessity. Yet, the only thing Gilgamesh needs to be rescued from is himself. The great builder of Uruk has gone terribly astray. Like a bright blade in the mind, Enkidu has been made not only to stop him, but to transform him. A spark that dissolves the night, a fallen star, and also Gilgamesh's twin, his mirror, the revelation of his entombment, the meteor's terrible weight exemplifies the king's affliction, his leaden soul. Gilgamesh's agony will become Enkidu's own. As you will recall, a temple whore is sent to, into the forest to seduce Enkidu and waken him. Weaken him. <laughs> Not waken him. Weaken him. 